in the last video, we showed how quantifiers matter to assessing validity, right? that we can't just ignore them and use the way that we were um, looking at validity for the truth functional connectives like conjunction, disjunction, uh, the material conditional, and negation. So in this video, we're going to look at a particular technique that's going to help us understand or uh, uh, analyze the uh, the ways in which a quantifier is is going to matter and what we're going to learn in this video is called the truth functional form algorithm the truth functional form algorithm The idea is relatively simple, and we just have to learn how to implement it and, uh, and do a little bit of practice. So I'm gonna introduce you to it and then walk you through the examples that are part of the problem set. Okay, so here are, uh, here, here's the basic idea. So recall that when we introduced quantifiers, that quantifiers had a certain scope, right? And that scope was a way to uh, for the quantifier to bind a particular type of variable. So to just give you a brief example, right, we had a difference between a sentence where we said there exists an X, and then we had say, uh, small X, and then we might have a conjunction, and then we had another, there exists X, small X, right? The idea here was that this quantifier out here, this first existential quantifier, found all the instances of the variable x up to that point. And then we had the conjunction, and then we had another quantifier, and that quantifier would bind all the instances of x up to that point. That was different than, sorry, I should have said cube up here. This should read cube. Right, so this first sentence says that there's something that's small and there's something that's a cube. Uh, we contrasted that with a sentence where we had the quantifier binding two instances of the variable x. Right here, this quantifier, uh, this x under quantifier, binds all the instances of x until the end of the scope of that quantifier, which we indicated with parentheses. So we're gonna use that knowledge to analyze particular sentences by underlining the scope of all of the quantifiers. And then at that point, what we're gonna do is sort of blur out all the information that's going on in the inside of the sentences that have the quantifiers and not pay attention to the connectives that are inside those sentences. So, if we look at the example that we have here, let me just quickly erase this so it's out of the way. Uh, you can see in, in this sentence with one, right? It looks like it's a relatively complex sentence. There's a, like a negation, there's conjunctions in there, there's quantifiers in there. So we want to know which connectives we need to pay attention to and which ones we don't. So, if from step one to step two, you'll see that any time we start seeing either an atomic sentence or a quantifier, we start underlining. So we start from the left side and we start moving to the right. So we see that there's a negation and then we see that there is an atomic sentence here that starts with the predicate tet. And we see that here the person started to underline that. And then once the atomic sentence is over, the underlining finishes. And we're gonna give that sentence a name. So we give that uh, uh, the letter A. Now we've got a conjunction. And now we see that we've got the, uh, a quantifier, a universal quantifier. So we start underlining that and we go all the way until the end of the scope of that quantifier. So in step three, that's what you see what they're doing here, right? They've started the underline under the universal quantifier and they go all the way to the end of that scope. And then you get, uh, uh, th that's the end of the line, and we're going to give that uh, a new sentence um, name, right? So we're going to call that B. 
Uh, one thing we'll want to look out for is whether a sentence has already appeared beforehand. So you'll see in line four, right? So we've got another material conditional, we've got a negation, and then we see a new atomic sentence. We start underlining that and we see that, oh, Tet D has already appeared beforehand and we had already given that a name, uh, which was A. So we're gonna give it the same name again here. We continue on to the right side, right? We've got a disjunction and negation. And then again, we see a quantifier. So we start underlining that sentence until the end of the scope of that quantifier, which is uh, just after the, that last instance of Y. That sentence has never appeared anywhere before. And so we give that the name C. So now when we collect all of that underlining and all the names, what we get is a sentence that has the following, what we call truth functional form. So six is the, I'm gonna be lazy here, truth functional form of one. So if we now look, at some other, oh, let me undo the annotate. Okay, so if we look here at some examples, here are first order sentences, and we call them first order because we're looking at the information related to the predicates, uh, as well in this case now to the quantifiers. So remember, before when we had things about tautologies, we were only looking at information with respect to the truth functional connectives like conjunction, disjunction, and so forth. Now we're paying attention to not just the information about the predicates, but as part of that first order information, we're also going to include quantifiers. So if we were to apply the uh, truth functional form algorithm to these sentences, Right, what you would see is we have this quantifier out here binding up to that point in the sentence. Then we would have a disjunction, a negation, and then here we start again with a quantifier, and the scope of that quantifier goes all the way to the end. And what we notice, right, is that uh, for all x, cube x is exactly the same in both those instances, and so we would have the truth functional form A or not A. So you'll notice, right, that A or not A is a tautology. And so we know that this sentence on the left, even though it has some quantifiers in it, its truth functional form will tell us right away that that is a tautology. Okay, compare that to the sentence underneath that, right? So here we have, uh, when we go left to right, we see that we've got a quantifier, the existential quantifier, the scope of that quantifier goes all the way up to that point. And then we've got a uh, conjunction. And then the scope of that quantifier goes all the way up to here. And then we've got the material conditional and then the scope of that uh, quantifier goes all the way up to the end. So the truth functional form of that is over there on the right, A and B, um, is sufficient for B. Let's contrast that with perhaps the very bottom one here. You'll notice that if we start doing the truth functional form algorithm on this bottom sentence, we start with the universal quantifier for all X, and we go all the way until the end of the scope of those parentheses. So both these instances of X here are being bound by this quantifier up front. So that would receive the letter A. We would treat that as one single quantified sentence. Then we have the disjunction or, and then we have the uh, second sentence with the existential quantifier. So the truth functional form of that is then A or B, even though you have this material conditional in here. But again, that material conditional is inside the scope of that universal quantifier. And so we're sort of um, treating that whole sentence as one sentence in the same way as when we use Fitch's world and you use those goggles, right? We're treating effectively this whole thing as a single block, as a single color block. 
Okay, so that's the idea behind the truth functional form algorithm and how we're going to use that to analyze the truth functional form of various sentences. So let me uh, clear this out and go over some of the uh, examples. So the first set of exercises is from 10.1. So let's do a few of these together. So the first one, I'm going to start right using that rule where we start to underline the uh, all the scope of the quantifier. And if we do that, right, I start with uh, for all x, and I keep underlining until the end of the scope of that, which would just be there at the end. And so the truth functional form of one is just a single propositional variable. It would just be a. Let's do three. So I start from the left. I've got uh, an atomic sentence here. So I'm going to start underlining that, cube A. I now have the material conditional. And then I have uh, a, an existential quantifier. So I start underlining that sentence until I get to the very end of the scope of that, which is uh, cube uh, X. And I look to see if that sentence has appeared somewhere beforehand. It has not, right? So we're going to be really strict about this. Um, I have not seen that sentence before. So the truth functional form of three is going to be if A, then B. Now, you know, right, if we read three and interpret it, we're saying that, look, if there's an object called A that satisfies the condition of being a cube, then there exists at least one object that is a cube. We know that's true, right? In fact, we know that's a tautology. But we're using uh, information about not only the predicates, but we're also using information about the quantifiers. And so that means that the type of logical truth that three is, because we're making use of that additional information, is a first order logical truth. That's, uh, but if we ignore that information, right, if we're only going to look at the truth functional aspects of it, then we lose those types of insights. And what we have is this sentence, which is if A, then B. And this sentence, if A, then B, is not a tautology, right? So again, that's what we're trying to contrast, is that information between first order information and uh, tautological information. OK, so let me do uh, one more. Let me go down to um, num number eight. So if I apply the same rule, I'm going to start from left to, uh, actually, no, let me, let me do number seven. So if I start from left to right, I see a quantifier, uh, the universal quantifier to start. And I need to go to the end of the scope of that quantifier. So I start and I see there's an open parenthesis. And I'm going to look to see where that first parenthesis was finally closed. And that happens right there, right? So that uh, parenthesis right at the end after large Z um, is the closing parenthesis to where I'd open that. So that I would treat as a single sentence and I would call that A. Now I've got a conjunction and now I've got an atomic sentence. So I would underline that, cube B. Then it, uh, so that sentence has never appeared anywhere before, so I would call that B. Then I have a material conditional, and I have another atomic sentence there that I call large B, and I would just call that C. So the truth functional form of number seven is going to be A and B, and that is sufficient for C. Okay, so for the remaining of these sentences, right, you're uh, asked to use the truth functional form algorithm to do this type of analysis. And then once you have uh, that, um, that analysis, then you should ask whether the sentence is a tautology. To answer that, you would use the truth table method that you've learned um, in, in the past units. If it's not a tautology, you then also want to ask whether it's a logical truth, but not a tautology. So like with number three, we know that that's going to be a logical truth. 
but it's not a tautology because if we did a truth table for number three, uh, we wouldn't get all trues under the main connective. And then the third option, right, is that, it's, that the sentence is not a logical truth um, at all. You should you feel free to put these sentences in Fitch, and uh, you could then even use totcon to, to check your answer um, uh, as well. Okay, and then let me just briefly say something about the other two exercises. So let me just clear this real quick. So the other two exercises are 10.2 and 10.3. Here, you're going to use the truth functional form algorithm, as I had just spelled out, to annotate the argument. You're gonna then write out the truth functional form of it. And again, you need to assess then whether these arguments are tautologically valid, right? So are they valid strictly in terms of the connectives? or whether they are logically, but not tautologically valid, or whether they're not valid at all. Again, make, uh, feel free to put these questions in, uh, in Fitch and double check your answers uh, before you do that. Okay, so this was an introduction to the truth functional form algorithm and how to use that to assess for the various types of validity that we've talked about so far.